In this video, we will introduce ourselves, we'll describe some research projects that we're involved in, and we'll discuss some important points relating to sign language documentation and relationships. Hi, my name is Ben. This is my sign name. I'm hearing. I was born and grew up in England. In 2007, I moved here to Trinidad and Tobago. I work at the University of the West Indies where I'm a lecturer in linguistics. I'm also responsible for coordinating a program on Caribbean sign language interpreting. We need more research and documentation of Caribbean sign languages because at the present there's very little information, there's very little resources and we need resources in order to teach, for training and for developing better policies to support deaf communities around the Caribbean. Hello, my name is Christian Ali. This is my sign name. I'm hearing. I'm currently an MPhil student in linguistics at the University of the West Indies. I was born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago. My first experience or with sign language research in the Caribbean was in 2016 when I took a field trip with Ian and Ben to different parts of the Caribbean uh, where I met lots of different deaf people. My goal is to continue working on sign language documentation as well as supporting deaf leaders in sign language research. My name is Ian Danulau. This is my sign name. I was born completely deaf and I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I grew up in Trinidad and I work at the University of the West Indies where I teach Caribbean sign languages and I do research around the Caribbean. Now we're going to describe some projects that we've been working on for around 10 years or so. So starting off with TTSL, which is Trinidad and Tobago Sign Language. There was a dictionary project, and the work on that project was actually completed in 2010. It was supported by the government, but the government never approved it. It was never properly released. An organisation called the Deaf Empowerment and Advancement Foundation, DEAF, has been involved in quite a number of different projects. So this has included TTSL workshops, they've been for both deaf and hearing people, training for interpreters, and again that includes hearing interpreters and deaf interpreters, and a mentoring programme. The purpose of that programme is to mentor interpreters on the news or national public events or interpreting the national budget or even interpreting in private settings. And that's really important. Now, older people, TTSL is very important for them. It's important that we document it and create resources because younger people tend to use American Sign Language, which is quite different. TTSL is endangered as a result, so we're documenting that. Now, I've worked with Ben and Rahana Omardine. This is her name sign. She's a hearing researcher. On a project in Providence Island in Colombia. Now, there was previously research by an American man called William Washable. He published a book 
on sign language in Providence Island in 1985, based on his research there amongst deaf families with Our work in Providence has included training, teaching deaf Providencians how to do interviews, how to do elicitations and camera work, how to set up the space for projects, how to plan projects, meeting deaf people from around the island and doing language documentation and archiving work. And also teaching children at the school because there's one deaf boy in the school, the rest of the children in the school are hearing. So we've been teaching them Providence Sign Language. So we met this one deaf boy and he'd had a cochlear implant and he'd been working with a speech therapist. He'd been speaking to his mother and grandmother. And the speech therapist had told them that the boy must learn to speak, must be taught to, taught to speak and not to sign. But he had really not developed, his speech had not developed. And he was really struggling as a result with his communication, communication with other children. It was a really challenging time he was having. When he met me as another deaf person, and then the other deaf people in Providence, he started taking in all the information. So we'd worked on doing interviews and language documentation all around Providence and archiving that work. And then we had a big event at the end to socialise. We invited all the deaf people from around the place and hearing people too. And we all came together to socialise together. And that boy was amazed. He was excited to see all the different deaf adults around, all the sign language around. And it was amazing. It was wonderful to see his development. Previously, he had been struggling such a lot with communication. And with sign language, he was able to communicate so well. Now I will describe a sign language documentation project carried out in the Bay Islands of Honduras. During our first trip to the Bay Islands in 2016, we had no research agenda. Instead, we went to the Bay Islands to make connections, to introduce ourselves, and to try to understand the situation of the signing community. Afterwards, we thought about how best we could fit in and support the needs of the community. In 2018, the Endangered Languages Documentation Program gave us funding for a language documentation project in the Bay Islands. The research team lived in the Bay Islands for three months during the project. The team was made up of me and Ben, who are hearing, and Ian and Kimon Elvin, who are both deaf. The Bay Island signing community is comprised of deaf blind, deaf sighted, and hearing sighted people. Bay Island sign language has been intergenerationally transmitted for over 100 years. Bay Island Sign Language is endangered. The signing community is small and there are no young deaf signers. It is possible that in the future, Bay Island Sign Language will disappear. Our project focused on documenting family history and the history of the community. Now I'm going to talk about some research projects in Guyana. Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago are very close to each other. You can fly in about 45 minutes. The first time I visited to do research in Guyana was around 2010. And I've worked on different projects, developed relationships with various people. In 2018, Ian and I took a class from the University of the West Indies to Guyana on a field trip. And we met members of the deaf community in Guyana, 
We visited an indigenous village. And in that village, we saw that there were many deaf people. The, both the deaf and the hearing people in the village signed. We also noticed that at the village school, the teacher was not from the village. So there were deaf children going to the school, but the teacher was talking. And so the children were missing all of the information. Another organization from Guyana had previously tried to set up a project where they brought teaching resources to teach the deaf children. But those resources were using American Sign Language. So we thought about this, we had discussions with people in the village and with the wider deaf community in Guyana and tried to come up with a plan what we could do. We wrote a proposal for a project doing language documentation and developing teaching materials to support teaching the deaf children in the village. We got funded by UNICEF and our project started in 2019 and it's ongoing. I'm going to talk about the topic of place. So we live in the Caribbean and we do our research around us in communities around the Caribbean. And this has a number of benefits. Because we're close to other communities in the Caribbean, we're able to maintain relationships. At the University of the West Indies, we teach our students about Caribbean sign languages and research. And in order to teach them about sign language variation, we were able to bring them to Guyana and they could see for themselves different deaf communities, sign languages in a village environment, and they're able to see the differences and to learn about different projects. Maintaining strong relationships with deaf communities involves ongoing contact, ongoing support, research, regular visits, and that's easier for us because the communities are close by to us. And the work is ongoing. It's not a case of doing a project and then moving on to something else, and never coming back. It's important for us to make regular visits, to continue our work, to continue documentation, and the work really is never ending. And we're not only involved in sign language documentation work, we're also involved in other kinds of activities, depending on what communities might need. So for example, supporting deaf leadership, supporting interpreter training, encouraging interpreting for public events, and various other kinds of support, depending on what a particular deaf community might need. Now, maintaining relationships at a distance, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, can be difficult. And our borders in Trinidad and Tobago have been closed for about a year now. There are ways around this sometimes. So we maintain contact through video chat with members of deaf communities around the region. But this doesn't always work. So for deaf-blind communities, for example, you really need to be there. You really need to be in physical contact in order to communicate and to stay in touch. Now, there are some disadvantages, especially regarding money. So in North America and in Europe, there are large funding organisations that provide substantial grants for this kind of work. But those kind of grants are usually only available to citizens or residents, people living in those places. 
and the grants available in the Caribbean tend to be much smaller for these kind of projects working on research and language documentation. But nonetheless, we continue with our work in the Caribbean. There's also a challenge regarding networking. So major conferences tend to happen a long way away from the Caribbean in Europe, in America, or in other countries far away from us. And there are limited opportunities for that kind of thing in the Caribbean. Nonetheless, we continue with our work. Our team has been working in a variety of different communities around the Caribbean. And those communities have different needs, they have different interests, and they have different identities. This means that our projects need to be different too, need to vary according to the needs, interests and identities of each community. And our relationships with those communities will also not be the same. Researcher identity is an important factor, but it's something that's not fixed and it's not simple. It's very fluid. So, for example, in the project that we're working on in the Bay Islands, in the community there, there are many people for whom being white and having English family history is an important aspect of their identity. And when we first went there and started meeting people from the community, they saw a connection with me because of my whiteness and my English family history. Now in other communities, such as the ones in Trinidad and Tobago and in Providence, my whiteness is interpreted in a totally different way. So that's an example of how identity varies according to context. In some deaf communities, they have deaf schools, deaf organisations, there are deaf events, sporting events, various other things. And then in other communities, they don't have those sorts of deaf activities. They don't have deaf schools, they don't have deaf events. Socialisation tends not to happen among the deaf community, but it's focused around the family. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no such thing as deaf identity or deaf culture. It means that deaf identity is something that is very varied and it's important for us to do more research in order to understand what it means to be deaf in different places and in different communities. The next topic is employment. Out of the three of us, Ben is the only one who has a full-time job. I'm an MPhil student and Ian depends on short-term contracts on different projects. The skills that are important for sign language documentation are to be able to communicate easily with deaf people as well as the ability to make meaningful relationships within communities. But what is actually valued in academia? Written English skills are valued, as well as your qualifications, such as PhD. For me as a student, there are some challenges as well. For example, for a successful academic career, you need mentorship and you need networking. Both of those things are easier to do in other parts of the world, such as North America or Europe. Networking lim opportunities are limited in the Caribbean. Also, if I were to do a PhD in another part of the world, for example, in North America, it means that I would be distant from the signing communities in the Caribbean. And this could possibly negatively impact my relationships. <laughs>